good morning, everyone. If you could have a seat, we're going to start in 30 seconds because we're going to also be live streaming this to other campuses. Good. So thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Carrie Sadermo, and I'm a principal investigator for Build Poder, an undergraduate biomedical training program. I want to thank you so much for coming out today for this important fall conference on science, race, and racism. I also want to thank very much our live stream partners at our five community colleges and at Cal State Long Beach, Gochia. All right, um, there's a lot of people I want to thank. I want to thank Mosaic so much. Mosaic is a program where CSUN students learn to mentor students at continuation high schools. Students at many high schools created this amazing art around the theme of science, race, and racism, so I really want to thank them for that. Our programs were made by Pahi Creative, and they did a beautiful job of the programs. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> I want to warmly thank, and I mean really warmly thank, the amazing Bild Poder Critical Race Theory Advisory Group, who worked for many hours to bring today's activities together. That includes Frida Endenjok, Roxana Lesso, Professors Tracy Buenavista, Will Garrow, Dina Herman, Q. Lam Hewn, Dimple Jane, Sarah Mounts, Jose Miguel Paez, Stevie Ruiz, Elizabeth Sussman, and Martha Escobar from the Civil Discourse and Social, Social Change Initiative. These folks have worked very hard and it's an amazing group that's really making change on our campus. I also want to thank our fantastic administrative support, Miranda Salas and Kathy Smith, who are constantly working in the background. We are funded by the National Institutes of Health, building infrastructure leading to diversity. This is our third fall conference around critical race theory, the foundation of our program. The purpose of the fall conference is to challenge and expand your thinking about biomedical science. Today, we'll talk about some of the ways that science has been complicit with immoral, unethical, or negligent research that has generated real harm, most often to vulnerable populations. Thinking about difficult topics helps us to reset our moral compass around the context in which our biomedical research takes place. I'll say more about that in a minute, but I want to ground us all in the reason for why we're here today. When we imagined Bill Poder, Chris, the PIs, Chris Kachikian, Gabriela Chavira, and myself, we focused on the NIH's call for transformative paradigms and practices. We agreed that we would not write a huge grant without speaking the truth and thinking outside the box. We looked to critical race theory because it seemed to us the current training programs focus mostly on science mentoring. Our holistic program acknowledges and confronts the institutional and cultural practices that enable some and divert others from opportunity. These institutional values and practices and the broader systems of economic and racial oppression that put these institutions in place contribute to health disparities, the theme of Build Poder. Build Poder acknowledges the significance of race, economics, sexuality, ability, religion, and other intersectionalities as partly driving a system that needs to be critically examined, deconstructed, and then reconstructed with loving, egalitarian, and community-based ideals that generate health equity. We have the capacity. We just need the will. The reconstruction of research can involve high ideals not bought out by big money or big pharma. High ideals like health and safety are a human right, like prevention of disease, or respectful holistic health care for everyone. Most of us are already doing this good work, but we forget to tell our students what made us scientists in the first place. My father's cancer, my neighborhood's garbage dump, my fascination with the medical field. We can collaborate, students in Mark Rise, Bill Poder, and their mentors, to think differently about science. You, the students, are the future of biomedical research. <clears throat> 
you have a wealth of knowledge and cultural insights that could benefit the scientific enterprise. For example, in recruiting participants into research, helping respondents understand the importance of full and honest self-reporting in research and in public records, or working with communities to say reduce stress, to increase exercise, or eat healthier foods. When Gabby and I interview students for Build Poder, sometimes up upwards of 85 students, one thing we invariably notice is that they are on fire. Our students are idealistic and they want to make positive change in the world. If you're a Build Poder mentor here today, please talk to, about the origins and significance of your work to your students. I assure you they will work harder when they understand how they are contributing to the broader picture. Our speakers today deconstruct and reconstruct. Describe how science does harm, as we'll hear from Miroslava Chavez Garcia, and from Karina Walters, how science can reconstruct a means of respectful, collaborative, and relevant research that works toward the ideals of critical race theory. Our goal is to challenge dominant paradigms by calling out racist and otherist practices that privilege some and harm our most vulnerable people and places. We work towards social justice using interdisciplinary and experiential methods grounded in the communities we study. I really appreciate your attention. Next, I'll bring up Stevie Ruiz from Chicana Chicano Studies, a passionate advocate for getting folks outdoors, yeah, um, who will introduce our first speaker. And after that, Sarah Mounts, faculty from Social Work, whose work on behalf of LGBTQ youth in foster care has won awards and grants. She will introduce our second panelist. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, bring up Stevie Ruiz. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. How are you doing? Good. Energized. Uh, I'm going to introduce Miroslava Chavez Garcia. Uh, thank you to both panelists for being here, including Karina, or Karina as well. Uh, Miroslava Chavez Garcia is professor in the Department of History at the University of California at Santa Barbara and holds affiliate status in the departments of Chicana and Chicano Studies and Feminist Studies. And she's the author of States of Delinquency, Race and Science in the Making of California's Juvenile Justice, Juvenile Justice System and Negotiating Conquest gender and power in California, 1770s to the 1880s, which have been seminal works for me as when I was a grad student. Uh, so it's actually really great to have Miros here, because I actually personally think of her as a mentor and a good friend. Um, so I'll go to begin, continue. As well as articles on gender, patriarchy, and the law in the 19th century California, her book manuscript, Migrant Longing and Letter Writing in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands, A History of Migration, Courtship, and Identity, as told through 300 personal letters exchanged among family members in the 1960s and 1970s across the U.S.-Mexico border, is currently under review at the U University of California Press. Uh, she has received awards and fellowships from the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity at Stanford, UC Mexis, the Ford Foundation, uh, and American Association of University Women, uh, and most recently, the Organization of American History and the Committee for Germany Residency Program awarded her a residency this past summer at the University of, I'm gonna butcher this, <laughs> Tübingen, Tübingen <laughs> in the summer of 2016. So without any further ado, let's welcome Miroslava Chavez Garcia. Everybody, I'm going to just set my things up here a little bit and have my timer because I talk a lot. Do I need to turn this off? No, I can put this on. Okay, I wasn't able to put a little um, mic thingy, so I'm going to. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, I'll be using this. And let me just test this. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. I didn't know it was going to be such a large room, but um, that's okay. Uh, I've actually taught a class with 525 students, so that was pretty nerve-wracking. Um, but I think it worked out in the end. Uh, well, thank you for being here. Thank you for, um, uh, for inviting me here, Stevie Ruiz, Professor Ruiz, and everybody else on the committee. This is an amazing project that you all are doing, multiple year project, and the commitment from the faculty. That's the trickiest part. And uh, it's wonderful to see that here. So I'm going to be talking to you today about my research a little bit and looking at, uh, primarily in my research, I started looking at these experiences of boys of color, youth of color, primarily boys, and I'll explain why, um, Mexican-American, African-American, and white ethnic uh, boys who were at this one institution. And um, so I'll be talking about today about the uses of science and scientific research in trying to determine the causes of delinquency. So that was one of the questions that they had, like, you know, they saw at the early 20th century that there was a lot of what they saw as juvenile crime, and so they became very interested in trying to solve this. And one of the ways that they, that they tried to solve this and address this was, was to turn to these um, questions about science and scientific research. So the title of my book is here, The uh, States of Delinquency. And I, I, when I started out doing this research, I had no idea what I was going to find, what I was going to stumble upon. So I want to tell you a little bit about that process of research. I'm oh, sorry, I'm trying to get it closer. Uh, so when I was looking for a second book project, I had finished my first project, I live in Sacramento, and I was trying to figure out what to do. I went to the state archives in Sacramento, and I started looking through all their stuff, and oh, it didn't really interest me, and then I pulled up these case files from this one institution, it's called Whittier State School. If any of you have been in Whittier, California, driven down Whittier Boulevard during the day, not at night, um, and you've seen an uh, institution called the Fred C. Nellis, um, what's it called now, Correctional Facility, at one point, it was called the Fred C. Nellis School for Boys, uh, but this, it's, it was originally established in 1890, uh, Whittier State School, and it closed down in 2004. So it was around for more than 100 years. And right now, it's still being disputed what to do with that land and that um, space. And I had a chance actually to tour that space. Anyway, so they had these case files at the uh, State Archives, and I started looking through them. There's two and flipping through them, there's pictures of the boys. They have a full run of the case files from 1890 to the 1940s. More than 8,000 case files that you can go through and look. And they're quite amazing. And um, essentially, on one side of the page, you see the picture of the boy, and then there's some like um, history about them. And on the other page is like their information, their parents, where they come from, lots of data that you could crunch if you'd like to do that kind of work. I'm a historian. I do a lot of, I'm interested in the social history. So looking through these pictures, I was thinking like, wow, who are these kids? You know, they really started calling out to me their images, the, the faces, their expressions. Who are these kids? Um, what were their experiences like? I started asking myself all kinds of questions as I was flipping through this because I thought, you know, this would be really interesting to look at their experiences. Um, other things, I also was thinking about what about the racial and ethnic um, gender experiences? Does that make a difference? Uh, when Whittier State School was established in 1890, it was originally established as a co-ed institution. That was the, there was a girls' department. It was a separate unit uh, that they were there. Eventually, by 1913, the girls were moved out and moved over to the, um, the, the California School for Girls in Ventura, not too far from here, which has had its own history. Uh, and then became the Ventura School for Girls. So those girls initially that were Whittier were moved out and established in their own institution for different reasons, and I can talk about that later. So I was interested in their experiences, and then also thinking about um, how did, what were their experiences there, what, how did the, the administration try to deal with the boys and the girls who were there, um, and then what, was it successful, right? What was, first of all, what's the, the definition of success? What happened to these youth? So in some of the pictures, sometimes they would have like follow-up pictures. So this is the case here of a, of a, a young man who was, um, experienced recidivism, right? So he ended up in San Quentin. So there's a picture when he was a boy, and there's a picture that has this whole, would have the whole sort of sheet of what happened to them. So that, uh, other questions that I was interested in, like, well, what happened to them when they left? Did they have, what were their experiences? And one of the basic things that I started doing when I was doing this research, looking at these uh, youth at this um, institution, is trying to figure out the population, like, who was there over what period of time? Um, and so what I did, I um, 
created this sort of a breakdown looking at the years, starting from 1890 all the way to 1940. And I stopped in 1940, um, and I'll tell you towards the end, um, because of a particular case. But in the 1940s, there was this big reform movement in the institution and um, statewide, and that's why I kind of ended there. Also, it was a lot of material. We kind of, as historians, we, we decide where we start and where we end. So um, I started mapping out the percentages of like how many um, Mexican boys, how many black youth, how many, how many whites, and other, it was a tiny, tiny amount of um, Asian American, uh, Native American, a few Puerto Rican, like less than five, like, identified as such. And so I created this little scale. Now, my interest was primarily in the last um, two decades, the 1930s and 40s, where I saw this huge change and shift. By the 1930s and 40s, we see Mexican and black boys making up between like 40 to 45 percent of the population. Like, you know, talk about um, uh, uh, disproportionate minority confinement, right? It's happening early. It happens very, very early in this institution, the 1930s and 40s, because we know that black and Latino Mexican boys were not 40 percent of the population in California. Yet you see this institution happening very early. So what's going on? How come there's so many boys of color ending up at this institution? These were other questions that started coming to my mind. So one of the things I do in my research I look at is um, looking at the history of this institution and how is it that what, um, what was going on in the institution that you know, it led to so many youth of color? What were their experiences like? So I look at the 19th century and the 19th century in California how they dealt with wayward youth, what we call troubled youth, is that families and communities dealt with these, with these young people primarily. So that these families and communities were the ones that were primarily taking care of them. And then later, we see in the 1850s, once California becomes a state, it becomes under US control, we have lots and lots of people coming in, and so there's a real need for institutional um, assistance. And so these institutions start developing, and that's how we have Whittier State School is established in 1890 because um, the public wants attention to these young people and, and they're taking care of their needs. And then, so the idea was that initially when Whittier was going to be established, they wanted to establish what they called a cottage system, right? There's two different ways to establish, that were established at these institutions where like this big, what eventually ended up to happen was like the congregate system where everybody lives together, the administration's inside, there's different levels and um, boys, of, of all different ages and experiences are thrown into one institution. And the idea for Whittier, they really wanted to set up a cottage system where they would have small buildings and then they would have boys grouped around families. They would have a house mother and a house father. And this idea was like, if you had a family, then a transition would be easier to come out of the institution. But that um, they didn't want to pay for it. The California taxpayers didn't want to pay for it. So they ended up with this big institution here, um, Whittier State School, a congregate system. But they tore this building down, so it's not around anymore. But this is what they ended up with in, in the 1890s. So um, Whittier's established in the 1890s. Less than 10 years, within less than 10 years, the place starts experiencing lots of abuse, um, unchecked abuse from the guards. There's a lot of uh, things happening that um, weren't intended to happen. And so by the early 1900s, the California governor, um, Hiram Johnson, brings in this new superintendent, his name is Fred C. Nellis, and he was a superintendent from 1912 to 1927. And Fred C. Nellis was one of these, what we called at this time, these progressives, right? <clears throat> it was part of the Progressive Party. Well, they had a real um, faith in science and in order um, to be able to create these well-ordered societies, right? If we remember from our history classes in the early 1900s, there was a lot of immigration, urbanization, industrialization, and so the cities were growing very rapidly. And so these, these young urban professionals were thinking, there's a lot of chaos, what do we do, how do we bring order? And so they started turning to science and scientific research as a way to do this. And so Nellis, he was really interested in bringing the scientific researchers to help him address his main question, which, what are the causes of delinquency? And so he brought in researchers um, to help him uh, create uh, this new kind of a young male citizen. And so he was really invested in creating these kinds of transformations, right, where you have this young man uh, to, the, to my right, the furthest right, um, where he, you know, this idea of transforming them from a delinquent to this idea of a citizen. So in some of the pictures that you see, you see them, the initial picture, their intake picture, and then you see them before they leave um, with the suit, you know, they, some of them have their little handbag, they're waving, like, I'm all transformed, you know, from delinquent to citizen. So that was Nellis' idea. He had these big 
um, ideas about how he could transform these youth. And actually, he was quite successful. He had a lot of attention around the country and even around the world. And so he, there's, there's several pictures. There's actually quite a few in the documents um, when, when he was there as a superintendent. This is actually an Italian-American boy who was also, again, uh, transformed from citizen to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from criminal to citizen, this idea. And so what Nellis did in particular, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, so what he did to sort of solve this question of the causes of delinquency, he had an idea already, of course, but he brought in scientific researchers, primarily PhD students, um, studying uh, this new field, psychology was emerging. So he brought in students to help him with these questions. And the main ones that I look at, the two at the very, very top in the middle, his name was um, Harold Williams. And he came in and studied the boys and that essentially became his thesis project to try to figure out the causes of delinquency. And the fellow right in the middle helped him carry out some of that work. And so what they did, they used two instruments primarily. One was the intelligence test, the IQ test. And the second thing that they used were um, social workers, the, the case files. When you, you know, social workers come to your home, they come and they take a report. Those are the two things that they did to try to figure out um, whether or not there were any links between intelligence, heredity, and race. Right? Those are the things that they were interested in looking at. You know, what are these connections um, between a boy's uh, home life, um, their, their family, uh, and their intelligence? So one of the things they started doing at the school is was giving the boys intelligence tests, right? And they believed that by these giving them these tests, you didn't know how to know English, you didn't have to, you know, schooling was independent of these tests. That what these tests were going to test was actually innate ability, innate, ability, innate intelligence, inherited in, um, intelligence. They would say, like, not a day of schooling is going to change your score. You know, this is really just what you're born with. This was the idea. And so they would give these boys tests, and the way they would score them, they would say, how you scored on the test, and then they would divide that by your age. So say if you scored as a 12-year-old, but you were 14, you do the math, and you score less than one. So anything less than one would fall under these categories. Anything one and above was normal or superior. So they had categories like normal superior, dull normal was like borderline normal, um, borderline feeble-minded, feeble-minded, and then idiot and an imbecile. These were like scientific terms that were used to classify people along intelligence levels. And feeble-minded, that's always a question, what is a feeble-minded person? Uh, we kind of laugh at this because today it's like this common, but it actually emerged in this period. So feeble-minded was um, essentially anybody who could have the capacity of a 12-year-old, but no more, but you could be made to, to be a good worker. Like you could figure out how to do manual labor, and get along and be a very productive member of society, but you would not um, develop beyond the capacity of a 12-year-old. And so uh, this is the, the other term they would use for feeble-minded is uh, moron. They would use that in the scientific literature here to talk about them in this way. And the key thing about the people who were feeble-minded in these categories, also moron, is that you couldn't tell, like this idea, they, they kept talking about how you can't tell what they look like. Sometimes they have certain features, but really it was something that, um, you know, you just couldn't tell. So that's what made it particularly dangerous to society. They would call it the menace of the feeble-minded because these people then, the argument went, could intermarry with others, with normal, and then pass along the gene of the feeble-minded um, or the moron to, this, to your children. So this, the belief in, um, at the time, they believed that you could inherit these traits directly. And they called these, these traits that were um, negative or, you know, bad traits, dysgenic traits. So it wasn't just being feeble-minded traits. There was many different kinds of traits. They actually developed you know, lists and lists of these kinds of traits that could be inherited. And so they were really interested in knowing, like, do you have these traits? Do you have the alcohol trait? Do you have the um, sexual immorality trait? Is your mother, um, you know, did she have children out of wedlock? They looked for all of these things in people's families and trying to figure out whether or not you had inherited these um, kinds of uh, traits. And so what they did with this particular, um, what Williams did with this particular testing, he's developed what I call these race pies. So he actually has, um, I was able to, his dissertation, a lot of his report that he did is out there in public. You can look at it. And one of the things that he developed here was um, this race pie. And if you look at them, I don't know if you could see them very closely, but the top one shows, so the black area, if I can read it from here, it's uh, moron, is that right? Feeble-minded, and then... Um, the other one is dull, normal, and normal. So if you look at the top one, it's uh, the boys who's, who were white and how they scored. Very small sliver of, of those were feeble-minded, the dark. 
Um, and the middle is colored for African American. And I estimate about 40% of, of black boys who took the test scored feeble minded. But then you look at the last one, Mexican. About 60 to 65% or 70%, maybe 60% I estimated, scored as feeble minded. So, um, and so they're making a link here, and they say in the literature, making a link between race intelligence and crime and criminality or delinquency and this is one of the ways that they begin to do this and actually they will say it was in the footnote which is kind of interesting they said well one of the reasons why we can probably explain that Mexican boys did poorly is because of the Indian blood right they go to this idea about the Indian blood and that is why they scored so low and that's why these connections there are so clear and so so they use the IQ test the other thing they use as I said before social workers um, went out to people's um, houses they went out to the boys' homes. They interviewed the mother, the father. They interviewed brothers and sisters, the teachers. They did all this kind of work. And again, they were interested in looking at these traits, like what kinds of traits. And ideally, they, was that you want, they wanted them to trace over three families, over three generations. So if you see, there's a little tiny hand, a dark hand. It's pointing at a dark box. And the, the squares mean boys, males, and the, the circles are females. And so they wanted to figure out among each generation what kinds of traits do they have. So they can say, aha. Uh -huh. So your aunt has this trait, so that's why you have this particular kind of thing, right? So they're trying to link this across families. And this is a very um, plain one. There's some that are like really elaborate ones, but then they also have these, they would, um, each square or each circle, they, if there was a trait, a dysgenic trait, they would um, mark it. So you sometimes you see SX, which means sexual immorality. Anybody who engaged any kind of um, sexual activity outside the norms, right? So if maybe you had children out of wedlock, or maybe there was rumors that you engage in homosexuality or other kinds of things, they would mark that there. Also, alcoholism. Um, another one too, if your family was migrant workers, they would put in for nomadism, the tendency to wander. That was also um, uh, a trait. So there was many, many traits. I don't have them all here. Um, also, your mood where you, you had like, these crazy mood swings and all kinds of things were linked there and they were trying to figure out scientifically how these traits um, were linked. And the goal here was to try to figure out if you had these traits, right, if you were feeble-minded, that how to stop that from being reproduced in the larger society. They wanted to contain the, this menace, right? So how do we think they might try to contain this menace? Stop people from having children. Yes. Exactly. Sterilization through sterilization. And actually, you might know the history of California a little bit here. Um, in California, we, pa we were the third state to pass a compulsory sterilization law, 1909, which meant that the state had the right to sterilize you, even against your consent and against the consent of your parents or your guardians, right? Because if you were feeble-minded, odds are, right, the logic goes that your parents were feeble-minded, and how would they be able to make a good decision? They couldn't. So the state had the right to sterilize you um, above and beyond your consent. And actually, in the United States, there were 60,000 sterilizations. California sterilized 20,000 people, um, more than any other state combined. Uh, there's a lot of history behind that, right? German, uh, German Nazis came to California to study our laws on compulsory sterilization. And even, I mean, a, I've been preparing for a class on women of color and social movements. I mean, sterilization is, reaches into every nook and cranny of our history, the 20th century. And even recently, right, there was a women's prisons where there was cases of women being forced to be sterilized. So it's a, it's a very complicated history. But in, and so with these social workers' case histories, when they would go study the boys, they would interview anybody. I have, these, I have a bunch of these case histories at home. Where I have more than 200 cases. And the last page, they would write this summary. And what they would say here about the boys is trying to figure out their future. And here they would say, like, considering the fact that this particular boy, that the boy is feeble-minded, he has no father, he will be unable to maintain himself as a useful citizen, could probably be made into a routine worker under close supervision. Uh, his immoral tendencies would stand much against his being returned to society, should be instructed along vocational lines, commensurate with his ability, that means be made a worker. And then at the end it says, recommend Sonoma. And that meant Sonoma State Hospital, where they would sterilize um, people. So another aspect of my research, I look at the sterilization, uh, look at trends of sterilization. One of my colleagues who's written a lot, a lot about sterilization, she uh, helped me get um, access to the authorization forms where they would sterilize people. And she now has all these records, and they're doing this huge digitization project where she's finding that Mexican females, Mexican women, were 
disproportionately sterilized across um, all Californians. So she, they're doing that research right now. But I was looking at one case of these four brothers who were um, who trusted as feeble-minded and who were there at the institution at Whittier State School, uh, Cristobal, Chris, Fred, Tony, and Albert. And only the youngest one was sterilized, even though they all scored as feeble-minded. And my question was like, well, why this young boy? Why was he um, only one brother of the four who ended up there and feeble-minded? Why did he, um, why was he sterilized? And it just happened to be the fact that the timing, so by the 1920s is the period in which um, uh, the 1920s was a period in which they started sterilizing more people than they had in the 1910s when his older brothers were there. So he was there at a time in which um, sterilization became much more uh, uh, routine. And so I was curious about sterilizations in general. I thought like, oh my God, how many people are being sterilized? It ends up actually for Whittier, there's very few sterilizations, primarily because the superintendent at the hospital didn't like those boys. He's like, they're too much trouble. They just get out of hand. I can't handle them. But then I was looking at sterilizations of young people. And so one thing that I found is that by the 1930s, this last category here, um, we see that Mexican and um, uh, others, uh, uh, other groups of boys like black and um, Puerto Rican, they make up almost 25% of, of young people who are being sterilized in California. This is across the board. So that's a high rate. That's a disproportionate number of people who are being sterilized, boys of color in particular, youths of color. So that was something else I looked at in my research. Again, making these links between race and science and you know, the uh, juvenile justice system. Um, and the, one of the, the primary people who did led these sterilizations and led this movement, really, I'm going to call it a movement, was um, the superintendent at Sonoma, uh, Fred Butler, who performed many of the sterilizations um, himself. And um, he was really committed to this program of trying to get rid of the the feeble-minded. And lastly, I look at as well at the Whittier State. So again, looking at, um, so I said my study goes into the 1940s. So Whittier State School in 1910s and 1920s under Fred Nellis is doing really well. There's this premier institution, you know, scientific research. They're getting the boys out that who, who they cannot work with, right? So it's becoming this premier reform school. And then Fred Nellis dies in the 1920, late 1920s. The school comes under a lot of neglect. The Dep Great Depression happens, and it really becomes this horrible place once again. And um, by the 19, 1939 and 1940, there's two suicides, and one, both are Mexican boys who commit suicide in the um, what we know today as the SHU, the Solitary Housing Unit, or at the, at the time it was called Solitary Confinement. And these, and so I look at the experiences of these two boys and what happened. And um, so we, there's pretty cool um, pictures that they have to look at them in the in the newspapers. The newspapers got very involved. I'm going to try to go really quick because I think I probably only have a couple minutes. Um, but that the 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 newspapers, lots of people got very involved. The first suicide, people said, well, you know, it's probably a feeble mind. They actually started using that same language. It's probably because they have some sort of dysgenic traits. They're feeble minded or they're really irrational. Then the second suicide happens within less than a year. They're like, no, something is going on at that institution that there's a problem. So the governor also calls for investigations. There's at least seven different investigations into this, into these suicides and into the conditions at Whittier State School that's driving these boys to commit suicide, to escape. Um, there's these, uh, one of the boys, Edward Leva, he's the one um, who, uh, the second boy who commits uh, suicide. He's an interesting character in how he carried that out what he thought he was doing. And so the newspapers become very interested in what's happening. So there's all these political cartoons what I thought were very powerful, the Whittier hangings. Um, this is about the investigation, that it's a whitewash, that these the internal investigations were not very useful. There's also this one I thought was really powerful um, of these gravestones of these boys and linking the deaths of the boys with Nazi Germany. Actually, they say, we know why men in concentration camps in Germany kill themselves, but we don't know why young boys will do that at this institution. So that they were really interested in that. They also link them to this one film. I actually watched this film from the 1930s, um, The Bowery Boys, if anybody is of my generation. They link these boys to the same youths who were at Whittier State School. So. Uh, the dead end kids, if you want, some of you are history buffs. They interviewed family members. I love these pictures um, of the like uh, pre Pachucas, you know, um, at this end, one of the sisters of Benny Moreno and the family, and they're sort of distraught state of that process. And they also had these really powerful investigations. Ben Lindsay, he was a very, uh, he was the, the leader of the juvenile court movement. 
and he was carried out this big investigation. And in this particular scene, I'll just say that he leaned over because they're asking the boys to talk about their experiences at the school, and the boy was ashamed to talk about the sexual abuse that he experienced, and he didn't want the women to hear in the room. So then the judge goes close to him, and he whispers it in his ear, like what had happened to him. Because through these investigations, they discover sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, all kinds of stuff. And here they are, in this is one family, Benny Moreno's, um, what is it, Edward Leva? Edward Leva's family in the in the, one of the investigation cases. And so what they figure out there is that, you know, there is a lot of abuse going on, and yet the administration is still trying to classify them as, you know, um, feeble-minded and so forth. And lastly, so that's my his, that's what I did in my research, looking at these links between science and scientific research and the causes of the delinquency and how it led to these practices of sterilization, forced sterilization, and what happened to these families. I mean, in the course of doing my book, I've had some people email me. Somebody emailed me about those four brothers, like, oh, I know those guys. I was like, what do you mean you know them? I mean, I tried to, I didn't use their last names for, for privacy reasons, but people know these people from the community from LA, right? It's, not, it's a very small community. And lastly, I was really, really interested in getting the voices, because these are just documents of people who are no longer living, a lot of them. And so there's one um, man who still calls me, we still have a good relationship, Frank Aguirre, and he was at Whittier in the 1950s. And a lot of what he described to me um, still went on, went on much earlier. So um, not, not a lot of things changed at Whittier for many years. So that's, um, and this is him when he was at Whittier in the 1950s. So, um, so thank you, I think I'm done. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's such a great pleasure and honor for me today to introduce one of my mentors and personal heroes, Dr. Karina Walters. Dr. Walters is an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and is one of the most influential scholars of historical trauma and social epidemiological research on the historical, social, and cultural determinants of health among American Indian and Alaska Native populations, as well as chronic uh, disease prevention research. She's the Associate Dean for Research, the Catherine Hall Chambers Scholar, and the Director and Principal Investigator of the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of Washington. Dr. Walters was a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, has served as Princip Principal Investigator or co-PI on over 37 NIH grants, from diverse NIH institutes. These include groundbreaking studies such as the Honor Project, a nationwide health survey that examines the impact of historical trauma, discrimination, and other stressors on the health and wellness of Native American lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and two-spirited men and women. She has also mentored over 90 scholars from historically underrepresented populations, including 35 American Indian and Alaska Native scholars, and has participated in 14 national research training programs for underrepresented ethnic minority scholars. Dr. Walters received her BA, MSW, and PhD, all from UCLA. She joined the University of Washington faculty in 2001 and became full professor in 2011. Prior to her career in academia, Dr. Walters was a professional tennis player, worked as a community-based psychotherapist, and commissioner for the Los Angeles County American Indian Commission. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Karina Walters. Hello. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Montz and the conference planners and the elders who are here. Um, I just um, acknowledge the indigenous people of this land and also my own ancestral um, uh, relatives. I'm enrolled in the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and in our way we always uh, acknowledge the indigenous land that we're on and I wanted to acknowledge the Tatavian peoples uh, of this land. And, um, and I also introduced uh, my indigenous name. Um, this place where we stand has great significance, actually. Um, 
this uh, area was a central meeting place for indigenous communities, uh, for the Chumash, the Tatavium, the Tongva, and other communities here, um, gathered here quite often, because just right off of Reseda and Parthenia, uh, is uh, an area that was known as an oasis. There's uh, underground waters that are there that still exist to this day, even though it's covered over. Um, and these were very sacred waters to the people here. And because this was a gathering place, I just uh, it made me reflect a little bit today um, that once again we stand near this beloved water and we have the opportunity to share and trade and, um, and uh, provide that intellectual sustenance to one another. So it's a real honor to stand here today. I'll be sharing some stuff specific to American Indians and Alaska Natives because that's been my experience um, around mentorship and, and science, uh, issues around science. But I do think that some of the issues I'll be talking about today uh, are transferable and translatable to other populations and other communities. Um, and, and I hope that um, you can find that as well. Okay. Yep, this is uh, communities that, uh, whose land we're in. Okay, doesn't want to change. <laughs> okay, um, this is a slide from Oklahoma, uh, and an area. Uh, actually, it's this is an area in Arkansas along the Trail of Tears. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. My tribe, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, we're the descendants of the survivors of the Trail of Tears. We were the first tribe to be removed on the Trail of Tears. Yeah, Cherokee always get all the credit, but we were the, actually the first. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but what this slide says is, Yo mecha okina bacho putaka etana kea ohofobi on yomano keo tagoke. The breeze that ruffles the stream knows not the depth below. Um, this actually was an, uh, an uh, English poem that was translated, it was the first poem translated into Choctaw. And I think there's a reason that our Choctaw ancestors um, actually chose this poem to be the first thing to be translated in Choctaw. One of the reasons is I think the, the issue of water. Um, as we stand near these beloved waters today, and um, uh, water for us has always been first medicine for all of our indigenous people. I just want to give a shout out to the Dapple water protectors right now in North Dakota. And um, so water is really it, 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 you know, we always talk about it as being sacred, but I want us to think about this um, really a little bit more carefully. So indigenous teachings teach us that water is our first medicine. Uh, the majority of our world is made of it. Our bodies are made of it. But I want you to think about water a little differently today. When you drink your water, when you look at your water today and before you, you take it, I want you to understand your relationship to the water. That water that you drink today, that you touch to your lips, is the same water that touched the lips of your ancestors. Because all water does is rise up to the heavens, only to return back. And in that way, you are connected to your ancestors, in that way, through that water. So just as we have these deep ancestral connections with water in place, our health too has deep connections to previous generations' wellness, their experience of oppression, and their life circumstances. So how we address our health today, and health inequities now for all of our people, will determine our wellness for our grandchildren's children. We're all connected in that way. So our health research right now, our imperative for building innovative health solutions to address these health inequities, really have to move beyond these static-based models uh, where we always compare our health to white people. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Kiave Koholukula said, America is really sick. White people are also really sick. Why would we want to raise our standard to the standard of other people who are sick? That makes no sense. So that we have to actually create our own um, standards and navigate the complex interconnections and multi-level interconnections um, of health. From structural inequities and looking at issues of structural inequities, all the way down to epigenetic memories and cellular processes. All of these things drive our health inequities and our health processes. Science and indigenous science, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, is finally coming together and linking and looking at how our bodies, our minds, our spirits are all inextricably linked, not only in the present, but across time and space and generations. So you're at a very exciting time right now in terms of science to move forward with some of these issues.
So I want us to think about health risk is not something that's innate to us as a people. As, as our colleague who had demonstrated, you know, all of the science, the racist science has always tried to say the problem is something innate in us, and that's not the case, right? It's not innate to our biology. But it's because of the cumulative impact of colonization and imperialism that we experience over our lifetime, and yes, even over our ancestors' lifetimes. And this colonial impact can outweigh even the benefits of social class, money, power, and prestige in present times. So the factors that really make a difference are living under conditions of material deprivation as kids and as adults. It's the historical trauma event exposure, as well as the chronic stress, violence, and discrimination that we have to endure on a daily level, and adopting different kinds of survival strategies to navigate that kind of messy terrain. So how do we build research and research scholars that can tackle these disparities that end up being culturally meaningful, culturally valid, and community credible? How do we do that? So first, before I get into kind of answering that question, and of course that means all of us bringing up scholars uh, like yourselves into the health research world, but there's a reason why we don't go in very often into this world, and I want to kind of highlight that a little bit here. Um, we have to think about the um, environment that we're in, in terms of our research environment, and what does that look like. So I want you to think about crabs in the bucket for a minute. You guys know about crabs in the bucket? Have you ever heard that? Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, there's a saying that, oh, we don't want to be like crabs in a bucket. Crabs in a bucket, um, the, as this kind of saying refers to, is soon as one of us starts to do better, we don't want to see someone else do better, so we pull them back down. That's crabs in the bucket, crabs pulling people down. So let's look at this metaphor and let's look at this for a second and challenge it, because this is what I'm going to kind of tackle around how we think about science today. Crabs don't live in buckets. We take for granted with that metaphor that crabs live in buckets and that that is a natural state for crabs to be in. So naturally, crabs want to bring each other down, right? If you're going to succeed in school, crabs in the bucket, someone else is going to bring you down because you shouldn't succeed in school. That's one example. Historical trauma. What's that bucket is historical trauma. We can't get over it because we're so oppressed because we just accept it as the bucket. Crabs do not live in buckets. Let me tell you what crabs actually do in their natural environment. Crabs naturally will pull other crabs up on rocks in the water. That's natural crab behavior. Bucket is unnatural. So part of our work as indigenous and other scholars is to start saying, we got a bucket that we got to deal with, and we cannot accept that as a natural environment for our scholarship and our science. We have got to get rid of this bucket, and we have to first acknowledge that a bucket is there, and the bucket has shaped how we think and how we respond. I am trained as a social worker, right? If I don't look at the bucket, which I haven't, there's been times I've forgotten about the bucket too. I could be in the bucket going, oh man, crab, how do you feel? It must be hard being, you know, all down here and up. If we only work together, we can all lift each other up. Why are we all pulling each other down? And meanwhile, I'm not looking at the bucket. So what does this have to do with science? Well, how you are trained and think about science is in a bucket. <laughs> And we haven't always looked at that. So let's talk a little bit about that. We need a paradigm shift, right? So we move from the bucket and we go to that paradigm shift of natural crab behavior. If we can get rid of that bucket, if we can identify the bucket, if we can start to dismantle the bucket, then we can emerge the science and scholars that we are born to be. Because we've always been scientists. All of our people have had histories of incredible science and scientists. The idea for me is like, well, when did science become Western? We call it Western science. When did that happen? Science has been around for millennia. So let's talk a little bit about that. A while ago, I was in New York City, and I was sitting at the Haydn Planetarium, and I was just relaxing. You know those planetarium shows, the star shows? You get to sit back in the cushy seats, and if you're tired, you might fall asleep. But that day, I didn't. And I was sitting there, and I was looking up, and the, it gets all dark, and the stars come out. And this big booming voice comes on the, the, the thing and it says, scientists have discovered that we are made of stardust. We're from the stars. Okay. I burst out laughing. 
Now it's New York City, so it was fine. People left me alone. But I burst out laughing because I thought, well, finally, science is catching up to our, our, our knowledge. We have stories about being star people. We have stories about coming from the stars. We have stories, literally, our indigenous stories talk about being from the stars. Now, that might sound provocative to some folks, but I, I want us to think about this because the bridging of what we call Western science and our indigenous knowledges, um, it's actually already happened in many ways. And part of what I want to do is say, let's get rid of the bucket and start looking at that because um, these knowledges have actually influenced each other in ways that we had, that, that, that has previous, previously gone and acknowledged. Okay, I'm gonna have to look at my little notes here, otherwise I won't be able to see what's happening there. Okay, so some of the some of the issues here. The reason why we don't always hear about this is because um, you know, science Science doesn't tell us the real story. It doesn't always, we aren't taught the real story about how science comes to be and what is science really. There's certain assumptions, and I'm gonna call it normative whiteness, that is part of this process. Um, years ago, um, I was uh, meeting with a, the, I had a professorship that, and I had a, that I was given, um, and I went to lunch with the uh, gentleman whose professorship was named after, and, um, and I was kind of nervous about that meeting, right? And so uh, before I get into that story, I want to kind of highlight one other thing um, about these kind of how do we get these things to work together, these different ways of thinking and knowing and being in the world. Um, you know, my Choctaw mom used to tell me, um, you know, be careful of ghosts and spirits. They're out there. You just leave them alone. My dad, who is native descent as well, but white identified, said, oh, Ghosts, there's no such thing as ghosts. It's a figment of the imagination. You just project them out into the world and therefore there's these things and it's, it's all imagination. So I had these two worldviews in my household and um, I used to think, you know, how do we make these two things work together? And what I discovered um, is that it was a gift. That I began to learn that I needed to say under what conditions which, which one operates. And that was the way I began to start to survive graduate school. <laughs> So both things can be true. You just have to be discerning under which conditions and skilled under which conditions do you want to put one of these forward. So I began to sit over time in comfort with this and, and I really draw a lot of my work on uh, from indigenous issues. And as I was sitting at this lunch meeting with this professor, um, we had a great time and it was really neat meeting the guy whose who's, uh, endowment I was under. And um, up until the last five minutes, <laughs> the last five minutes of the meeting got a little tricky because um, he said, you know, I've had a great meeting with you today, but I just have to tell you, I don't believe that indigenous people have science. It's not indigenous science. He goes, I can accept worldview, I can accept cultural point of view, but I can't accept it as science. Okay. I was like, take a deep breath. How am I going to deal with that? And so I started to realize he fell on the side of a more classic Western scientific approach, an approach called methodological naturalism. Okay which basically dominates almost all of the training that we have in the behavioral sciences. And this approach basically holds that there are truths out there and that we do science to prove them using certain kinds of classic scientific methods. But I then realized I was arguing for much more of an instrumental approach and from an indigenous perspective as well, more on that later, which holds a much broader definition of science. And I was as I was intellectually sparring with my colleague, I realized that our debate basically was a microcosm of an ongoing debate that occurs in the sciences, which is, what is the nature of science and scientific method, right? And by the way, there is no consensus among philosophers of science of what that really is. There's just different approaches. So there's not a unified one-way approach, even though sometimes we're socialized to think that we are. Out of that experience, I wanted to begin to think a little bit more about, well, what is the indigenous knowledge? What is indigenous science? What does that look like? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I, I brought, has brought that into some of my work. Let's see, where, what am I? Okay. So when I think about when did um, science become Western, I started looking up the word science. Well, it comes through an old French word. It's derived from, um, knowledge um, from Latin word to know and the Greek word for science also um, talks about um, science meaning a systematic recorded knowledge 
And it talks about the separation of knowledge. So there was a point in science where there was an idea of separating knowledge out and compartmentalizing and things like that. And that's when I really realized that at some point in our history of development of science, especially in that um, the other approach, the Western, more Western approach that I talked about, um, there was a focus on separation and compartmentalization. And I realized that that's where um, our divergences started to happen. Because from an indigenous point of view, all things are related. All things are related. And if, now finally Western science is catching up to that as well and starting to look at that from cellular studies uh, and epigenetics all the way to um, social studies around some of these issues. Um, but I wanted to begin to challenge that and think about that. And, you know, I turned to somebody when I was looking at, you know, how do we tr challenge these ideas of science? Um, and this quote came um, because I realized that um, one of the big differences that I also had with my colleague was uh, indigenous knowledge values the intuitive mind. It values the intuitive ways of knowing. It's comfortable with um, the ambiguity of life in situations. We don't know everything out there. It's not about finding necessarily a truth. It's about kind of understanding relationships and patterns. So these are some of the ideas of some of the indigenous knowledges versus the Western ways. But this quote says, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant but has forgotten the gift. He was talking, Albert Einstein said that. So um, as I was saying from the indigenous approaches, the idea is that we are all related. Um, and a good example of that is a Maori proverb getting back to the water uh, idea again. I am the river, the river is me. Um, and some of the other intentions with indigenous science versus these approaches is the uh, idea that um, the importance of preserving a whole vision and not compartmentalizing our, our scientific approaches um, and the, as I acknowledge, acceptance of intuitive knowledge. And there's two other ones that I want to highlight really quickly. Um, I do intervention research. I, I'm a health, uh, I do prevention research in health. And one of the things I, I always do when I create these interventions from an indigenous perspective is I always try to develop our interventions based on our ancient teachings, our original instructions. Because what colonization has attempted to do is disrupt our, our original instructions, our ability to fulfill original instructions as a people. So quite often I rely on our old stories. I will dig deep into archives and other things to find or pull out from the community the stories that guide protocols for behavior and behaving well in the world. Because that quite often is tied to health and well-being. And we can grow our interventions from those kinds of things. The second thing I look for is relational ways of being. Again, the, the idea that we're all related, right? His, the historical trauma events and colonization purposefully disrupted our relational ways of being. So part of our interventions are always designed about restoring relational ways of thinking. Quick example of that. A person who's been in the mental health system a very long time, they learn to be a good client, and part of that is um, you know, certain ways of approaching their disease. Disease, literally out of balance, out of order, right? So I'll give you an example that Dr. Eduardo gives um, quite often. This is a typical situation. Indian client, American Indian client comes in, and you say, you know, so tell me a little bit, you know, tell me who are you? And sometimes they'll say, well, I'm, uh, I'm depressed. Right? If you've been in the system a long time, quite often people are socialized into becoming their disease. And so then you've got to add a little humor there. And you go, oh, depressed? Ah, oh, did your mother name you depressed? Did your community name you depressed? Tell me about that. Like, wait, 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 no, no, no. No, I said I'm depressed, but no, my name's John. No, no, you told me your name is depressed. Let's talk about how you received that name. That's a very important name. You know, and, and the reason why Eduardo does things like that is because it's recognizing two things. One is you have a relationship to this thing called depression. You now are owning it on some level, and you've received a name. Now, for naming for our indigenous communities is very powerful. Naming means you have a responsibility to somebody. Naming means the community recognizes you a certain way. It means you have a certain way you should be walking in the world. So Eduardo turns to the client, and he'll say, hey, so tell me, how did you receive this name? You know, and the client's left by now totally confused. I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, you know, it's a bunch of people. They're usually in big suits and coats and jackets, and they're standing around a table, and they're opening up this very sacred book called the 
diagnostic to statistical manual for disorders, and they go all gather together, and they go, oh, yes, his name shall be depressed. And he's like, oh, no, 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 that's, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't accept it that way. I don't know what you're talking about. And so then you get to reframe it. Well, tell me about your relationship to this thing called depression. How often does it visit you? Now, he'll shift the language because now if you have a relationship to depression, you are not depression. If you have a relationship to something, what can you do? Can you break up with it? Can you tell it, okay, we're over? <laughs> no, you don't get to visit me at three in the morning anymore? Okay, right? You start to, cognitively, you start to make a shift. That's based on our indigenous knowledges. And that's how it gets played out in the mental health programs. Okay, I'm going to run out of time before I have all the things I want to say. I'm going to move up uh, forward a little bit here and, and identify a few myth busters about this intuitive knowledge. The one problem with Western science is we socialize our students to say, science is supposed to be learned in these little tiny incremental parts. And anybody who's doctoral students understand how this works. It's like you're supposed to do a little added piece to the study so it gets to go a little further. Well, guess what? Great breakthroughs in science does not happen that way. That's actually not how it happens. Quite often, the best breakthroughs in science are outside of the thinking of the contemporary times. These are the guys who are the heretics, or the women who are the heretics of the science generation. The great minds quite often take a leap of faith. They go much further because they include their intuitive mind in the process, as well as the science that's been generated before them. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that. Okay, so first the myth quiz. You know, quite often some of these stereotypes that we have to deal with, and this is part of the problem, is because our knowledge isn't represented um, fully in the work that we're studying. Um, that one myth is that Europeans discovered scientific knowledge, but American Indians stumbled upon it. We somehow just stumbled upon it. The assumption there is that, you know, that somehow this knowledge is always out there. Well, the reality is scientific knowledge comes from a process of trial and error. It's not easy, it's messy. Scientists basically first make an educated guess on their observations, they test it carefully and observe the results to see if it's right, if it wasn't, they guess again. So, um, the haphazardness of this process, Albert Einstein said, um, if we knew what we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? All right. Okay, the other one is uh, American Indians' uh, knowledge and interventions sprung from hunches and intuition. So the other flip side of the stereotype is because we're American Indian, we're very romantic, and we're always in the intuitive mind. We're never in the scientific world. We don't really have logic, which is not true at all. We've been some of the greatest scientists around, too. Um, so we have to deal with that stereotype. So fact. Two things. One is American Indians have used both inductive and deductive logic. We've been some of the most uh, amazing scientists, and I'm going to get to that in a minute about a quick example of that. But the other piece that gets not sold in this story, and it, it's, it's actually unfortunate for Western science, is the impact intuitive knowledge has had on Western science. You know the periodic table? Mendeleev. How did that come about? Does anyone know? Yeah, he had a dream. He had a dream, that how it came, that's how it came, came about. Um, same with um, Kekulé. He had a dream of a snake biting its tail, which enabled him to um, think about the structure of the benzene molecule. And that was basically the birth of the field of organic chemistry. Neurochemistry, a dream showed Nobel Prize winner Otto Lowell that the chemical messengers, we now call neurotransmitters, are responsible for the flow of information to the human brain. So these, uh, you know, in both cases, um, we've had some great influence, right, in terms of exploring the intuitive mind as well as the, the scientific mind in that way. In terms of medicine, I just want to highlight this in terms of indigenous science. North American Indians had medicinal uses for over 2,500 species of plants, in addition to expert use of botanical medications to treat medical conditions. Um, from, you know, and it, we also had um, Purify, being able to sterilize and purify wounds well long before um, biological antiseptics came on the scene um, in Western science um, by the 1900s, but Aztecs were already doing it. So there's been some powerful um, stories out there, um, but the indigenous knowledges don't get the credit, and they don't get identified or, or, or demonstrated. The mamala plant, the, the Samoan healers, showed Western scientists about the mamala plant they made 
the drug Prostatin, which is the HIV AIDS medication that we currently use today out of that. But you don't really hear about the influence of indigenous knowledge in that process. So I just want us to, to acknowledge that there is a history there that's already influenced science and that our ancestors have been a part of that process. But we have a great opportunity of, of liberation now where we bring our indigenous knowledges and our Western science knowledge together to work together as tools. And you, as scholars, become the vehicles by which you can either be a witch or a healer, depending on how you put those tools together, right? Ah, okay, that's a little bit of a... Um, so one of the things I'm putting out here is that sometimes when we talk about this, um, this history of this importance of using intuition and other kinds of ways of knowing in our processes, they say you're anti-intellectual. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm anti-intellectual. Because it's important that we do mentorship to begin to say, hey, there's ways to bring our indigenous knowledges into the forefront of science. Um, a couple things I just want to um, highlight, because I'm running down on time here. Um, is a little bit about the educational disparities. Um, our folks are obviously um, not at the level that we need our communities to be at. Less than 0.05% of professors in the country are American Indian or Alaska Native. Um, very small numbers, less than 12% um, doctorates graduating each year are anybody of color. So we are very much underrepresented, which I think directly connects to some of the barriers to our success. Um, you know, uh, as scholars of color moving up the pipeline, it's always hard because people don't always understand our worldviews. Quite often we're in a position of always having to justify our worldviews and um, explain uh, the importance and relevance of our work to people who just aren't exposed to it or don't get it, and that's stressful. Um, the other piece is um, navigating through these systems that have not always been on our side. As our colleague showed earlier, these reform schools and boarding schools, um, there's a huge history of historical trauma um, uh, that impact a number of our communities and impact our success. In my family, going to school was not a value. It was like, you know, you had to kind of do it, but, you know, my value was in what do I contribute back to my community and my family? It wasn't really about attending you know, uh, a, a cool car. That wasn't what it was about or anything like that. This is the Carlisle Indian School in 1890. Um, and I just want to acknowledge this connects a little bit to my colleague's presentation. You know, American Indians were forced into these boarding schools. One of the reasons why you see low numbers in, in uh, the school here is because most of the Indians were probably taken over to Paris Indian School during that period. Um, uh, and which basically the federal government forced Indians um, during the 1880s, 1890s into these boarding schools. So hundreds of thousands of our kids had to go there and you were forced to not speak your language. It was a form of genocide. Um, and a nicer term would be ethnocide, but it, the target was systematic destruction of culture and life ways. Basically the saying was you want to kill the Indian to save the man. So this gives you an example of the Tom Torino when he first arrived. And this is him three years later. Okay. The other piece to this um, is dealing with microaggressions, another barrier. These everyday discriminatory events that we encounter as people of color in classrooms and, and uh, other kinds of experiences. Um, these are those everyday microaggressions that could be in the environment, your culture isn't even represented or even discussed, or if you are discussed, it's like you don't exist anymore, you only discuss, discuss, are discussed as a historical uh, anomaly. <laughs> um, there's Daryl Wingsu does a lot of work in this area. Um, to give you an example of one that I had dealt with in academia, I was asked by my colleague um, at U UW when I first started there, um, to come to class to speak and lecture in her class. And I said, sure. And she said, great, can you come dressed as an Indian? And I'm like, so that's one of those moments when you have these microaggression experiences. The reason why they're so stressful is because the burden of dealing with it falls on the person who receives it. Then you gotta decide is it safe or not safe to address it. And then if you address it, there's gonna be consequences, right? Either they're gonna deny it, they're gonna minimize it, they're gonna mystify it, say it's all in your mind. <laughs> Or they're going to get white guilt on you and be like, oh, I'm so sorry, and you've got to still emotionally take care of them. So it's a lot of stress in that moment, right? Um, so I turned to my colleague and I thought, okay, do I have tenure? Does she have tenure? Okay. I said, so humor, we use humor, right, to get through this. Sometimes I'm like, do you, uh, you do know that um, no matter what I'm dressed as, I'm dressed as an Indian, right? 
she's like, ah, oh, can you at least wear your costume? And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> we're getting worse now, I'm getting mad. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, this is really offensive, it's not a costume, we regalia, but no, I wouldn't wear that in class, it doesn't make sense. Um, and she goes, okay, can you at least wear earrings? I'm like, bro, oh, wow, okay. I said, tell you what, I'll come to your class if I can come, uh, you know, speak about whatever I want to speak about. And she said, yeah, that would be great. And I said, great, I'll come dressed as an Indian. And she's like, oh, you kill? I said, I promise I will come dressed as an Indian. <laughs> So that day, what did I do? I put on my best outfit, took out anything that could be recognizably indigenous, and wore my like Calvin or whatever I wore that day, Calvin Klein or something. And I walked into class that day, and she was in there, and I said, class, I am dressed as an Indian, and today we're going to do a whole lecture of microaggressions while your professor is here. Well, that didn't really work, but she still didn't get it. But, you know, and that's part of the stress is sometimes we still have to continue to engage in an environment that is not helpful. So let me just highlight a couple of things that you can do and, and, and I want some mentors to do in terms of overcoming some of these barriers. And then I'm going to have to conclude. Okay. Um, you know, part of the being a good mentor is recognizing that this is the stress that people are enduring and what they're having to deal with. Um, and to recognize that culture of normative whiteness, that bucket I talked about earlier, that we have to first acknowledge that it's there. Um, and that there really is coded behavior and social scripts that we have in um, school-based settings for proper behavior. And what, it ha what, what that basically causes is what's called protective hesitation from both parties. Both the professor and the student sometimes don't want to engage in talking about this because for the student it feels very risky. Even for the professor it might feel risky and for different reasons. And so people have protective hesitation which creates very awkward moments, right? It's those moments where you're like, uh, do I talk about it or not? And it's important to talk about it. It's important to begin to do that with a very compassionate uh, understanding towards one another. And it's part of that reciprocal relational way of being. It's part of the healing of that historical trauma I was talking about earlier. The other piece is to deal with colorblind racial ideolo ideology. Um, it's, it's important because you know, the idea is that if we don't talk about this and, or, or if we just say, let's just talk cultural competence, let's just talk about um, you know, um, the problem of diversity. All of that kind of language is, is, is problematic um, because it problematizes diversity as opposed to celebrating, you know, the importance of seeing the differences and how important and critical we can, that is, that we can uphold that and uh, move towards that in a good way. And so there's some work that talks about moving from cultural competence beyond cultural competence to really looking at cultural humility really knowing who you are in your positionality and knowing that you're not supposed to know everything culturally about people. I think it, for uh, as a native person, I can't find it more obnoxious when someone tries to tell me about my culture and that happens all the time when people want to say, oh, I, I, I you know, the, like they're going to be all of a sudden the Indian expert and they're going to tell me all about my people or, you know, and then all of a sudden it becomes like coded behavior and I, I'm supposed to be down with that and it's just, it's, it gets kind of crazy making. And so um, that's not healthy, right? We should. So there's some work that says, you know, you want to develop color consciousness. You want to develop privilege checking in that process uh, as a mentor. So I can talk a little bit more about that later. And then finally, I just want to end with a model that we, we use, um, which we call the indigenous mentoring model. Um, corn, beans, and squash um, is, uh, we were known as great agricultural people. Um, the Choctaw, and um, we were part of the Northeast and the Southeastern tribes that have the three sisters model of planting that's still used in agricultural processes today. But the idea is that this is a way of integrating indigenous knowledges into a mentoring system. Um, so beans, what beans do is they add the nitrogen um, to the soil that the other two plants need, that these three things have to work together to um, produce a flourishing plant, right? So the beans add nitrogen to the soil that other plants need, they add fertilizer, they literally create a fertile ground. So part of our job as mentors is to create that fertile ground. Corn actually produces the physical support for the beans um, to twine around. 
And so it, it provides the support. Again, our role as mentors is to provide that. The squash actually grows so low to the ground that the big leaves reduces the ability for weeds to grow and interfere with the growth of the plant. So it's the stress buffering function of mentors that it's important that we need to play. Now one thing that we don't make explicit in this model, but I'll tell you from a spiritual level, corn is the one that connects the heavens to the underworld. It's the one that, it's, it's so important that it connects all of these worlds together. So if you think about that too in terms of our, our, our theory and our buckets and, and bridging that gap so that we have the, these uh, intuitive indigenous or whatever our, our own understanding of the worlds are as well as that science, that these things can work together to produce a healthy and well plant. So that's a, an example of what we've done with some of our indigenous teachings. Am I, am I good? Okay, so I'm going to end there. I'm happy to entertain a little bit later if, if folks um, stick around uh, about how I translated that kind of work into an actual study um, uh, on the Trail of Tears um, with, with my tribe. So, yuck, okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're going to have a few questions now, and um, these are questions that come from the Critical Race Theory uh, Committee. And we want to thank you very much. Both of those talks were just amazing. And it, it occurs to me that we really do research in a bubble, and we really need to express uh, a much broader understanding of what science is. So um, many of our students are eager to know about the uses of critical race theory in applied science. Given your research, what are some tips you might suggest for students who are interested in working with low-income and historically disenfranchised communities? She said, I go first. Um, so um, I've had some students in the past who've asked me about this, these questions, like how um, they might get involved. And I think one of the key things that I always subscribe to and is really important to me is finding ways that you can mentor young people. So mentorship programs, and there's many different ways to do that. Um, lots of organizations, sometimes on campus. I just know they hear this program over here, the Mosaic. There's a lot of opportunities I think you can find either in your department or in your community, in the church. There's many different ways to mentor other uh, young people, whether it's children or whether it's you know at different levels. So I always encourage people to, to do mentorship work. To me, that's really important, giving back, paying back. That's been my outlet is uh, mentorship programs. Um, I am a historian, so a lot of my knowledge is really rooted in the early 20th century. I'm not as familiar with the contemporary juvenile justice system. There's so much. Uh, that work, a lot of it's by sociologists and criminologists. But I do direct people to some of these um, other kinds of uh, opportunities. That's good. <laughs> um, I, I was just thinking that, um, uh, you know, it's really important to have more faculty, more um, both cultural mentors, both um, on campus as well as off campus, that it's really critical for um, uh, us to extend into the community and, and really get rid of these boundaries between the university and the community. Uh, mentors can come in many shapes and forms. Actually, the way I got into graduate school was not necessarily through um, the university. It was actually a Cherokee elder in the community that told me I needed to go. Um, and had it not been for her seeing my potential, I don't know that I would have necessarily believed some of my academic um, community uh, teachers as much, um, but because I, it was a cultural imperative that I needed to go, 
bridged by a Native faculty member that reached out to me, Dr. John Redhorse. Those two things converging helped to move me forward in, in the direction I needed to go to. So it's really important in developing these mentorship programs that, that we look at cultural and community leaders that could also serve as important mentors um, through the pipeline in this process. Okay. And then their second question was, Today, um, we have mentors paired with mentees in the audience. As mentors who are experts in CRT, what advice would you give to mentors and mentees who build a healthy to build a healthy relationship with CRT as the core line of inquiry? One of the things I would do was to, um, one idea I had was to form small reading groups. Uh, so reading groups or groups where you might maybe perhaps watch a video, but do some kind of shared activity. So I like reading a, a, a short reading, something that's legible. CRT, uh, critical race theory, sometimes can be heavy uh, as a historian, um, but it is very useful and gives you very useful language. So I would say mutual reading and then discussion of those readings. That's, I think, one way to do that through these. Um, it could be just small groups or it could be larger community groups. Also, perhaps responding to the readings through um, different forms of writing, maybe through poetry. You know, trying to find a way that um, as an outlet for young people that they can recognize, like how can they translate it? I think the translation part is always difficult. Um, and how to make it relevant to them. I think that's really important to do that. So I would, that's my suggestion, so. Um, I think the cultural humility piece is really important. Um, recognizing um, who you are in relation to your posi positionality, especially around any kind of status around power and privilege. Uh, even if you're a faculty of color, um, being aware of that because now you're educated in a way that has power and privilege attached to it. And sometimes if we've come from um, um, the suspicious background and we come up through the pipeline, we forget that and we're, we're still in our mode of thinking like we were growing up, but the students sitting before us going, I don't know if I could talk to you and there's some of those elements. So power and privilege and being aware of that and being mindful of how that gets played out in everything we, we do and say um, verbally and non-verbally with our, with our students. The other thing is we have a lot to learn. So part of that cultural humility is that, you know, not to put the burden on the student to educate us, but rather that we also understand that we build uh, an important relationship that we're mutually uh, learning from one another in a way that's proactive to our development. And then also just being mindful of watching out for the internalized negative messages that students carry, and those tapes that they carry that are problematic, that sometimes surface um, uh, now and then, um, and that, that can sometimes combine with negative messages that we might also internalize and hold and, and to interrupt that when that, that comes up. Um, a good example of that is this Alaska Native young woman, I saw her say to an elder once, you know, we've lost so much, you know, we've been so oppressed, we've lost so much, we've lost so much of our language, we've lost this, we've lost that, she went on and on and on, and as a mentor, she could have been like, yeah, we have, right? You know, and gone down that road. But she said something really powerful to this young woman. She looked to her and she, she looked at her, and only an elder could get away with saying this, but she looked to her and she said, actually, you know, young woman, you know, it's you who are lost. As long as we have the trees, as long as we have the land, as long as we have the water, as long as we have all of these things, we have our knowledges, we have ways of moving forward. So the, if the minute you start to think about you being lost, you've bought into a way of thinking that's not healthy for us. And that was a beautiful challenge to this. And she could have so easily gone down that train where we've all been down there, right? We're like, yeah, it's rough, you know, and we can go down that train. But this is an example of you got to just be really mindful uh, of uh, thinking about that. Um, Linda Hogan, the Chickasaw poet, said, um, it's not that we have lost our ways and intelligence, but we've been lost from them. And so part of our job as a mentor is help people to close that gap. And, and, and Linda Hogan says, those knowledges are always there. They're patient. They're waiting for us to find them. So it's a way of uh, embracing that in a, in a healthful way that will help produce better relationships with your mentees. Thank you. Those are great. Are there any questions from our audience at this point? No? Yes, there is. No. Okay. Um, is Alex here from Mosaic? Because I wanted to let him say a few words. Can you come on up, Alex? And I want to... 
And while he's coming up, I want to mention that um, Professor Chavez Garcia has her book up here, and it, this is a rare opportunity to get her actual signature. So please do, if you can, come up and um, get a copy when, before you leave. Hi, thank you so much. How's everyone doing? We're still awake? Yes? Yeah? Okay, you're a little quiet out there with no questions, but that's okay. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here, for supporting this very important cause in terms of looking through the world through a very critical um, lens, right? I think that's kind of the importance of this whole, this whole um, conference here, this whole event. But what I did want to share is um, a little bit of what went on to produce some of this artwork. Um, in the Mosaic program, it uh, stands for Mentoring to Overcome Struggles and Inspire Courage. We're based out of the sociology department here. So I'm the executive director of the program, I'm also faculty in the sociology department. But what was interesting is that a lot of our students in the continuation high school level have never heard of critical race theory, which is understandable because um, a lot of the teachers we found were very resistant to talking about this whole issue of race within the public uh, school classroom. So we had to approach it, approach it in a very strategic way where we were just asking students what they experienced in their communities that they found unfair. And then everything just started to fall apart and, and really come together in a way where we didn't really expect, right? But this is not something that's unique to my work. Uh, we work as a team here. We have a, a group of Mosaic mentors. And if it wasn't for the Mosaic uh, mentor committee, um, none of this would have happened. So if I could take a minute to ask them to um, join me up here on the stage and acknowledge them publicly because they work tirelessly. Committee, MAC members, are you out there? Come join me up here, please, Tanya. And I just... Uh, I just want to personally acknowledge these wonderful group of young people here. They're all CSUN alumni. And one thing that I want to acknowledge is that all of them are graduates here. And technically, they don't have to be here. But what's important is that they're here and they're delivering this very important message out into the community with the kids we work with every day. And like the, the theme of this conference is interrupting this dominant narrative where it essentially says that the kids in our communities, the colored kids, the disadvantaged kids, that they they can't succeed, right? So we're here to interrupt that narrative and we're here to switch that, that narrative and essentially here to convince our students that they could do it, that they could be doctors, they could be lawyers, they could be scientists, right? And they could be educators and professors at a university because we use ourselves as an example when we do our work because a lot of us came from underprivileged communities. So we like to use ourselves as an example and say that it is possible. So one thing that we do in the Mosaic program is encourage our mentees to dream big because in their current situations, their, their dreams are very limited and they're very encapsulated in this very, in this very um, I guess, state of mind where it doesn't allow them to think outside of their reality. So I think the, the Mosaic mentors do a really good job in helping these kids dream out of the box and, and dream into the capacity that they never really thought was possible. So again, I wanted to acknowledge the, the Mosaic committee here for all of their tireless work in the community. Thank you. And um, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Bill Poder and, and their advisors in the committee, uh, especially Professor uh, Jose Paez and Dr. Sarah Mounts here, um, who are essentially uh, mentoring us through this whole process. So like I said, this is not work that we do alone. We do it uh, again in the community, out, um, out there in the community as, as well with our CSUN community. So um, I, I deeply, deeply want to express my appreciation for not only events like this, but for everyone involved in it that continues to work tire tirelessly to bring these very critical issues in our, into our community and especially in our classrooms. So again, thank you very much. And if you haven't had a chance to check out some of our mentee artwork, um, go ahead and take a second to do that before you leave. And um, hopefully you'll leave with some inspiration. So thank you again very much. And I uh, really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. I think we're adjourned, so have a fantastic day.